and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 998th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation featuring Lucy Mitchell Innes and Phyllis Tuckman. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Lucy Mitchell Innes co-founded Mitchell Innes and Nash in 1996 with her husband, David Nash, with a gallery on Madison Avenue. In 2005, they opened a second space in Chelsea. From acclaimed surveys of 20th century masters to solo exhibitions, the gallery has proven expertise in both advancing the careers of emerging artists and maintaining the superiority, the superior standards set by established artists. Um, our host today is Phyllis Tuckman, critic and art historian. Phyllis Tuckman teaches and writes about art, particularly sculpture. She's taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts. She is an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. We are so, so thrilled and honored to have you both in conversation today. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Phyllis. Lucy, thank you for doing this. Uh, I love the timing that you have this fabulous Eddie Martinez show up right now. So I hope everyone who's listening uh, goes down to Chelsea to see it. Um, I thought I would start at the beginning, partly because I'm a trained art historian, but so are you. And mm -hmm. you went you went to the court told. Did mm -hmm. you plan on teaching? Um, how did you get involved first at the Henry Moore Foundation and then later at Sotheby's? Well, um, very quickly, um, um, I guess when I was 16, I, I, you know, I had grown up with uh, around art and looking at art. And um, I realized that this is, I was just one of those people who realized that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And um, it was suggested that I um, apply to the court old, uh, although I'm, um, at that time it was, they only took 15 undergraduates really in order that they could keep their grants from London University. Um, anyway, uh, I was admitted and I went there when I was 18, which was way too young to be in a research institute. I mean, way, way, way too young. And, um, but I was sort of on this mission, whatever that is. And I, um, I was in a, in a, um, a first seminar, my first semester there, um, with, oh. Anthony Blunt, <laughs> redating, uh, redating Poussin or something, and then, um, and then uh, re the, also another, and then Raphael, and it was just, I was so, uh, I I just thought it was so, un I mean, I was just much too young. I thought it's so uninteresting to be redating Raphael, but I immediately gravitated towards contemporary, the most contemporary program that there could possibly be. Of course, since this was a Art History Institute, they absolutely didn't, um, you know, they wouldn't teach beyond, uh, well, certainly not beyond pop art. That was the cutoff at that point. And they, um, but I did it in order to, to get away from what I regarded as the boring aspects of art history. And um, I wanted to be as involved as possible with what was really happening in real time in the studio. And, but I did, like everybody else, I got a full historical, art historical training. And I would say that is where my a lot of my thinking comes from when I look at art. I didn't think I could ever be an artist. I didn't think I was, I didn't have the confidence. I didn't think I'd be any good. Um, I'm sure I wouldn't have, I mean, you know, I just didn't have. So I thought the next best thing would be to learn and know as much about it as I possibly could. And so I did an undergraduate at, at the court old and then I stayed and did a postgraduate there too. Um, and then, uh, of course, I left and it was 
it was impossible to get a job in London and, and at that time when I graduated and left. Um, so I went and I worked, uh, started working for Henry Moore um, on the cattle revenue of the drawings. And um, I was just, you know, unpaid intern and that's it. Um, and it was really, uh, you know, it was really very, very interesting because you could see, you know, how he worked, his work process, his thinking, his thought process, um, everything. Um, and um, uh, I worked there for maybe a year, a year and a half, and then I and then I went to work for um, Tony Caro which was a definitely a life changing experience because you know Henry Henry Moore if Tony Caro grew out of response to Henry Moore and the whole history of British sculpture, which is I think what the twentieth century can clearly you know, we clearly know that's what what one of the great contributions um from the British art scene at that time. And um that was a you know a life change totally life-changing experience um, working directly with him watching him in the studio every day um, and um, yeah I mean that's the short version if you want to know how I got to Sotheby's I can answer that in a bit <laughs> uh, uh, I you know I I didn't I didn't know that uh, you knew Tony way back when uh, so I'm fascinated but you ended up at Sotheby's and 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 I don't understand how you ended up at an auction house neither do I um but okay. I don't understand how I, I mean I know how I ended up in an auction house I was doing something for a not-for-profit an artist space and um they were organizing a fundraising event and I was working on that and then they offered me the job to um, uh, be responsible for the contemporary sales uh, in London and Europe um, and in those days it was a tiny there were just two of us in the department and by coincidence we were both called Lucy and um, it was a job I didn't terribly want to take because I wasn't very interested I didn't really want to be in the commercial side of the, but in the end, it was a great, a extraordinary experience because you had direct contact with an, an enormous number of works of art and you saw the back and front of everything, everything. Um, and so, um, you know, I, it was one of the, you know, two or three great learning experiences of my life traveled all over all over Europe and then a, a year and a half into that they transferred me to New York and then I you know lived in both places and um, but I mean one of the things about sort of this is you really really see a lot of art and 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 a range of art so so. Mm -hmm. Did you focus in immediately or or you just stayed with contemporary art? I stayed I stayed with contemporary art. I that we uh, we'd put that bridge with you know John Sherman and Anthony Plant <laughs> uh, at the court hall. I just didn't want to I didn't want to have to deal with theory and history and all of that. I wanted oh. to see I wanted to be where history was being made in the studio in real time and uh you know that my interest in that hasn't changed at all so. did you did you meet a lot of artists at the time or or yes. that later yes i did yes i did i did i did a whole generation and, and and what was it like suddenly living in new york after you i mean you're english well, I didn't think very much about it. I mean, a, uh, a a huge move. I thought I'd just do it for a couple of years to, 
you know, just sort of fill the need for, they needed somebody I didn't know that I, you know, came in 1983. I didn't know that 41 years later I'd be still here. But um, yeah, it was a big, it, 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 it was, it's a bigger move than you think, but um, it was certainly, um, I didn't even think about it then. <laughs> so they, they called me one snowy day and I was in Geneva and they said, could I come to New York next week? Um, and that was, that's the way it went. In those oh days, you kind of did, you just did things like that. You just sort of, okay, yeah, I'll be there. Wow. So, I was working on putting together an auction. And I didn't know what President's Weekend was. I was just sitting there working. I turned up for work on that Monday and it was all close. I had no idea. Not a clue. It, it, uh, you must speak many languages. Well, and, and not as many as I'd like, as I should. Um, yeah, you, if, you, if you grow up in England and if you certainly work at Sotheby's in London, I mean, nuance of the phone, it was always a different language, always. So oh yes, I did. and and at, at, as as a student at the court, you had to take a third language anyway. So, so yeah, French, Italian, Spanish. I was too stupid for German, but my German was quite good when I worked at 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 at, 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 at uh, Sotheby's. But it's you know you have to use it. You have to use these languages. Well, that's more than I got out of the institute. So. Uh... <laughs> I never got it's to... different. It's different. I mean, here you you know you don't you know it's different. If you're living in Europe in the in the seventies, you needed languages. Now, if you go to France, everybody speaks English. I, you know, it's shocking, it's... and they speak American English. That's the big shock for me. Um. Yeah. So, after working at Sotheby's for so long. You decided to become a private dealer. Was mm -hmm. that as dramatic as it sounds? It was a big change, a big upheaval. Um, but you know, I was time. I had, I had, you know, the, the travel schedule and the uh, uh, was quite um, was pretty tough. Working at sort of this, so I became a private dealer, and then in nineteen ninety six, we opened the gallery. Uptown, and then in 2005, we opened a gallery downtown. And I didn't realize until I was getting ready to talk to you that basically Uptown was specializing in um, older art, in classics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We worked with the art estate with for the work image that you're looking at right now. And that work came from the art, art estate. And what I've always wondered about is Jean Arp that different from Hans Arp? No, no different. Just just the Swiss call him Hans and the French call him Jean. It's kind of amazing. Um, mm -hmm. The next, uh, I believe, is yeah, exactly. And so you mm -hmm. showed Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, mm -hmm. Uptown and downtown. Yes, they asked us to represent the estate after Roy died. Um, and this, what we're looking at here, is the first show we had um, in the gallery downtown, although we'd had a pretty amazing show of the work that uh, Roy's commissioned for the 42nd Street subway. Um, we'd had that done that uptown. That was an amazing show and with a fantastic catalogue that won an award. Um, and kind of researched and did came out of his. You know, Roy was passionately interested in science. Um, in you know the sixties, the the World's Fair in New York um, was was a huge influence for him. So anyway, he he and he got all the science magazines and that particular exhibition, um, which was up to uh, um, addressed that issue. And and this was um, you know, Roy and Surrealism. 
Um, and I think we had a raw and surrealism drawing up there at the same time. And, and um, the painting on the left went to a museum. The painting on the back left went to a museum. In those days, you know, museums didn't have, you know, they, they didn't have all of these, you know, believe it or not. So. And I'm assuming you knew Roy, who was just such a nice man. Yes, he was great. He was wonderful. Um, my, my, my memory of him is, is that he was having a, a party at his, and, and he was playing the trumpet on on the balcony of his house in, in, uh, in Long Island. It was amazing. It was wonderful. Oh. Incredible. I think I think the next slide. Oh, the next slide is surrealism. Um, mm -hmm. Is and is the next slide from uptown? Nope. They're all. No, no, I don't see any here from uptown. Uptown of that particular other show. That's a show we did of Tony, Tony's, the uh, the barbarians, which was. Um, just a radically diff unexpected different um, body of work. And um, you know, Tony was known for, you know, welded, um, steel, um, was for, for, you know, define the the base um and then suddenly he makes this body of of, of work uh inspired by an antiquity um and uh, these these are all vaulting horses from a gym um and as a, he was working in south france with a lot uh, with a ceramicist so uh, a lot of these elements were fired and then put together i mean tony worked in a way that uh, brought elements um, uh, where he would find uh, find things in junkyards and scrapyards uh, and buy large amounts of it, and then he would uh, bring them together and weld them together. That was his 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 thought process. I mean, it was exactly the opposite of somebody like Donald Judd, who who ordered everything and. It, and I, I'll come back to that because it, uh, in a minute. And so this, um, people thought we were mad when we had this show because it was just so. But like, what is he doing? Uh, it was, but I just always thought that these were, were, you know, just Tony being who he is, which is, you know. Um, uh, they were amazing, and they ended up. In the collection in Spain, I believe. Oh no! A lot. And he and he did did at least three series with figurative elements. Yes, he did. The well, the Stations of the Cross, and um, he and um, then the, yes, he did a number of different Trojan War. Uh, Trojan War, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But. I, it was beautiful in your space. Yeah, yeah. Your space was made for these works. Yeah, I know. They really kind of occupied it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, Tony's work is really made to be seen indoors. Um, and his... Do we have any other pictures of other Tony exhibitions? We have a, we've had a lot of yeah. them on here. So this goes back to what I was talking about, how he liked to work uh, with found elements and bring them together. However, here he was working with uh, Perspex, Plexi. He called it Perspex. And they those elements had to be ordered and fabricated and he couldn't change them. Um, and I remember him turning to me. This is one of the last two vids I had with him. And he, he turned to me and he said, I'm never working with this stuff again. I hate it. Because it didn't give him the flexibility that he wanted um, and the ability to improvise 
And, you know, when you're improvising with multi-ton sculpt, you know, things, that's what he liked to do. Um, but this was a this was a real challenge for him, and he, he was he was madder than a hornet about it. Yeah, these 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 red flexi elements these all were fabricated in Germany, whereas the, these other elements there's a, there's a cedar uh, this is a, a railway side uh, siding or railway um, what's the word I want you know and um, other found from 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 junkyards. And what we did was we did something which I don't think Tony would have ever allowed was the works on the wall on the left. Uh, these are very early um, works he did in the 50s. So we had the last works with the first works. And it was just incredible to see because there was a fully formed vision um, right in those early drawings you could see the whole, uh, the whole, you could see 40 years of ideas coming out of those very, very, very early uh, what's on paper, um, you know, directly influenced by Picasso at the time. And those are from the early to mid 50s. Um, but they were with, they were, when they were with these, uh, these sculptures, they just, um, yeah, the sculptures were made in 2013-14, and those were made in 1952, 53, 54, 55, right around there. And the way they spoke to each other was just incredible. And it, that, to me, was you know just so rewarding to be able to to do that. So I guess that's the historian in me. Well, that's what I always, I always think the amazing thing about working in an art gallery, if the show is great, you get to see mm. it every day. Mm. It's absolutely true. You do. You do. I mean, this, this, this one here on the right of the bull, I mean, the sculptures from 2012 or two, also from earlier, um, huge sculptures that directly relate the energy, the lines, the forces, the, 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 the aggression is exactly what um, you see in Tony's work 40 or 50 years later. Wow. Oh. And the, the next slides also, uh, I didn't realize you worked for the de Kooning estate. Yes, we did. That was one of my first assignments. Um, was to appraise the uh, the estate of de Kooning. He wasn't even, actually it wasn't an estate. He was still alive when we started working on it. And then and then he he, he died. Um, and yes, this was, I spent a year in a warehouse working on every, every single work they had. And this is an exhibition. Um, Based upon a painting um, from 1987 or 88 called The Garden in Delft. And here we're showing on the left very, very early work, extremely early work. Um, that's from 1937, 38, 39. And then on the right is something from the mid 50s, where it's after he moved to, to Springs, Long Island. And then in the middle is one of the very last paintings that he would have made from like 87, 88. Um, and again, it was, it's just to show the, you know, continuity of his vision, um, the evolution of his vision, his, his, um, that was, uh, yeah, that was the kind of thing I loved doing. Oh. I, I, I always loved visiting Tony Caro's studio in London, it was so enormous. Yeah, that must have been something for you then to be in de Kooning's much smaller studio. Well, it was still it was still plenty big enough, um, and he had the hydraulics for these big paintings, um, and all the paint, the color was all you know. There's a precision in 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 the process. Um, um, you know, very 
consistency in, in, in his use of color, which I found to be absolutely fascinating because once you started really looking uh, and studying the work, you could see that, for instance, this purple, I mean, there's just a little bit there uh, in that green painting. You know, he was using that in 19, uh, in 1947 um, in various, you know, paintings of women and and, 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 and for the 50s, early 50s, he was the same purple comes, the same orange. Uh, it's just the consistency, um, which I always find to be um, just interesting. Um, even though there might be dramatic changes. I mean, some of you will remember the Whitney Biennial um, in 1980 three or four where he showed these late paintings and people thought that he'd, he'd lost his marbles, they'd gone mad. Um, this, you know, big blue and red and white paintings, all blue and red and white. Um, that actually there's a real thread through, through, through the work, um, even though he'd made a huge change. So, Working, knowing, 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 knowing these artists and and working with them, have you ever thought of writing a memoir? Um, well, no, well, no, not really. I don't like really talking about myself very much. So, um, uh, I, I, I should, but no, it's an answer. I like okay. to live in the present. So, okay, that's great. So now here you are with Pope L. It could not mm -hmm. be his work could not be more different than what we've mm -hmm. been looking at: Arp, Lichtenstein, Caro, de Kooten. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. end up with Pope L? Um, well, in two thousand and seven, something like that. Popel was without the New York um, uh, gallerist and he um, he, um, our director at the time um, proposed him and I um, uh, wasn't, you know, I didn't know the work um, and n nor is he really known for work which you could be easily shown in a gallery because he's a performance artist. That's what he's really, you know, the, all the crawls and the performances he did in the 90s were were um, really what had defined him. But like uh, um, an artist with, you know, utterly brilliant, he, 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 he could, he was multidisciplinary. He could, do a performance, he could do video photography, and it turned out that he was also he drew a ton. I mean, there's a ton of drawings on napkins and loads of them. And he, uh, you know, was evolving a language. He wrote, um, and he was really a, a multidisciplinary, absolutely brilliant, brilliant mind. Great educator, um, and. Um, so that's how, you know, we, we gave him a show again, it was uptown. He showed a coffin with a flag, um, an American flag and a sound, a wind sound coming out of it. Um, and um, we have any other pictures of any other shows of his? Oh yeah, that's right. These are all collage elements from, I think that might be the last show. Um, this must have been at the uh, oh no, I was going to say at the time of the Whitney, uh, it's just before the Whitney, yeah, probably, probably what probably was. Yeah. Okay, we go. He has a room, there's a, there was a video in there, and all the holes and everything on the right. These are amazing photographs. These he uh, he found somebody who had a collection of these uh, photographs which were taken in the um, uh, 19th century um, with uh, of, of 
black caregivers looking after white children. And he he doctored them all and sort of inserted himself in in them um, and um, made a whole suite. They were really really amazing and wonderful and extraordinary statements about you know the history of race. Um, and you know those were in that show. And then along along the back, these were. Popel was very interested in the food stuff. I mean, he had no, uh, he had no um, pre anything, any material could be uh, put to use in in his performances and in his work. Uh, so I think these uh, were uh, compost on the left, which was sort of decomposing. Um, uh, you know, peanut butter, uh, mayonnaise, um, flour, particularly um, foodstuffs which had a history about um, uh, like peanut butter. And, you know, he knew the whole history of peanut butter. He knew it from start to finish. Been no. A, been a, yes, I can, I can give you it. I can give you it. If you want to hear it, but uh, it was it was a foodstuff de developed for the uh, U.S. Army during the Civil War because it was no. extremely high, extremely high protein, yes, and very nutritious and cheap, and then became a foodstuff for poor people. Uh, mm -hmm. and it went on, goes on from there. So peanut butter was a big part of his, and you know again. The way artists, it just, the thing which really engaged me, and I worked very, very, very closely with Popel, um, you know, he said, well, you know, I was looking at Ryman um, because it was, you know, that was one of the artists you could see in Soho in the, you know, in the in the 80s and 90s, and he's deeply, deeply interest, interested in, in, in Ryman, and actually made quite a lot of works in which he signed himself Ryman. Um, but he took Ryman's use of, hidden color um as a and it became a political statement for him um in other words painting white over color was basically about um obscuring painting out african the african-american people and so i mean you know ryan is a, a huge influence uh, actually one of the projects we want to do is um something between pobo and ryan Wow. How, um, if we go back, can we go back? Um, so he showed a room at the Whitney and it wasn't yes. it Rhymes. And how do you sell something like that? Um, well, you know, it, it, it's a, you do, it does actually happen. Not, not not so often but um you it can it can and we have um i mean works like that um you know they they are made for people for institutions you're not going to put it in your home um but generally when people collect po bell they that you know they collect in depth. They collect, don't collect one. They collect you know because they want every aspect of his work. And because he was a multidisciplinary artist, and you know you're going to cover the whole terrain. Um, so, wow, um, I had no idea. Mm, 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 mm. I think it's it's about really um, digging into the content and his what he was thinking and understanding and that's what engages people when they realize the enormity of his of his uh, thought process and practice i think that's um um he just was i think he's probably one of the most brilliant artists i've ever worked with uh he knew i mean he had read everything about first of all you know the history, the plight of the African American 
I mean, he'd only read absolutely everything, but he'd also read everything by Shakespeare, everything by, um, um, you know, could quote Ulysses. You know, he just uh, was an extraordinary, extraordinary man, extraordinary person. So when he sh had the show at the Whitney, you must have been absolutely astonished at the focus on him. Well, by then we all we we knew um, it, 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 we knew that the Museum of Modern Art was going to happen, um, and it kept on getting delayed and this and that. And we also knew that the Public Art Fund was going to happen, and the the complexity of the negotiation of trying to bring three institutions together. Um, um, that was that was a challenge, and. Um, um, and then at the same time, he was invited to make a pro proposal for the Venice Biennale. And uh, I had to call up, you know, some of these institutions, they, they sort of expect exclusivity. And um, I had to call up and I said, well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to tell him he can't do, he can't make a proposal for the Venice Biennale? <laughs> anyway, wow. we pulled it all together. And there are three simultaneous shows in... Uh, because he won the Bucks Bar Prize, he had within a year he had to make an exhibition. So he did the Flint, you know, the one that relates to Flint Water, which was a tremendously important project. Um, and um, and then he did a crawl for the Public Art Fund, and uh, then he did. We had the, the the you know the survey show of all every single one of the early performances. Wow. It's beyond four crimes. And then, and then, um, the next thing that happened after that was um, he, uh, the the Brandhorst Museum in Munich, in Germany, um, started collecting the work and collected it in in depth. And they have the largest public collection of um, of his work in in Europe, including you know the Great White Way, including. Um, paintings, uh, a lot of objects, um, like a suit from Thomas and Square Crawl. Um, and one of the last things I did with Popel, which I really was amazing, uh, we were traveling in Europe because he had this show at South London Gallery, um, which since he was given very little notice, I was trying to encourage him not to do it. But in two hours, he just sat down the desk here. He happened to be in New York and sat down, and he he conceptualized this show at the South London Night Gallery. It was five months out, five months out, and he had multiple shows. I, I said, you know, he said, "Shall I do it?" And I said, "All right, let's let's go for it." And he he made the most. First of all, the show changed, of course, and he made the most brilliant. He kind of reconfigured eating the Wall Street Journal, so it became this cascading sculpture. The entire length of of the their, their, their gallery. But anyway, when we were in Europe together, we tra we went to Germany, and I went to I said I, 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 we had to go to Munich to the Brandhorst Museum to meet um, with them, and uh, we went. I said, "Come on, we're going to go and look at Joseph Beuys because because Joseph Beuys was a big influence in that entire, you know, that entire era." Um, and we went to look at the Joseph, and I have pictures of him, um, you know, looking at the whole Boyce Museum and the, at the Lemberg Gallery. It was really amazing, just amazing to see him um, there. Was, I'll never forget that. So, anyway. Wow. Wow. But mm. to think that the, the range from Ryman to Boyce, that's mm. amazing. Yeah. Well, he was very, very interested in in um, you know the whole era of artists from um, uh, the seventies and eighties, conceptual performance, all of that. It was very much very influential. So he was very he was studying at, at Rutgers um, with a conceptual artist of the time, Jeff Hendricks. So that's important. Well, wow. you're telling me more than I, I knew about Popel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have some images of Martha Rossler. Oh, yes, Martha. Look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how so do this... 
This yeah. was a show okay. I felt we we had to do um, after the Roe versus Wade decision was reversed because here is an artist who is, you know, um, um, began her feminist activist work in 1968. Um, and um, I really thought it was very important to show uh, that people should see how long um, we've all had to, to fight the good fight for, for, for the issue of women. I mean, Martha grows out of pop art um, and media and communications. Um, she might argue with that, and if she's here, I'm sure we'll hear from her. Um, but she... Um, she her vision of, of of the condition of the way women were perceived in in the seventies and eighties, and it still filters into today um, the pressure we are all on, under. So if you look at the back on the right wall, you'll see all that underwear stuffed with. Yeah. By that was something she she would make. She made that. Uh, that was her for her graduate thesis at the uh, University of San Diego. Um, and what there? Yes, that's right. That's it. And you know what was what was there was um, you know this this vision of women out of women's magazines uh, was completely at odds with, with what women's bodies really look like. Um, so she goes gets all this underwear, particularly sort of girdles that really you can't even, God knows where they are today. I mean, you know, all that stuff. Um, and we had to put all the K-pop and stuff in it and then uh, um, install it. And it's a st it was a, sta a statement about the, the disparity between, uh, you know, women women's bodies um, as they really are and women's bodies as media presents them. And if we move a little bit we show a couple of other images of this exhibition. There you go. This, you can see, and I don't know whether we can enlarge this or not, but this is Martha's entire feminist series along on the back wall. And in, in these cases here um, are the original collages that she from which she made these works of art. So the collages she considers to be ephemera. She does not consider them to be works of art in their own right. But the the collages are uh, um, how she cut up all the images from women's magazines, sometimes from um, porn cards that were available down on the docks in San Diego, all sorts of different things. Um, and she made it this entire series, which is uh, around about thirty. Um, feminist works and we showed them with the original collages um, which was just uh, found incredible and then she came in on the day of the opening and she brought in all these very early objects of uh, that she had made um, again using feminist women's imagery so it was she was just had such a insight into the way women were perceived and, and uh, uh, a real pioneer, and it's a, it, it's an extremely important body of work. Um, as, as, and uh, this is how we could have been lucky enough to, uh, as women, to be able to redefine ourselves. It's really thank, thanks to people like Martha. We're fighting the good fight a long, long, long time ago. And did the so, critic uh, did the critics realize that the show was? post the overturning of Roe versus Wade? I don't know. I can't remember. But that's the purpose of it. It was to, to really pinpoint feminism at a time when uh, we seem to be going backwards and not forwards. And mm. as, 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 as an art person, are you astonished mm. uh, by, the, by, by, by the subject that 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 art has changed so much. I'm 
sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Oh, um, I'm, I'm kind of asking about the politics of it. This is so far away from, say, Henry Moore and Anthony Caro. Yes, but for me, I, I mean, there's always been a political component, a real interest. In, I mean, I'm a pretty diehard feminist and pretty interested in politics. Um, um, so um, I don't, I don't really look at, I, I look at artists uh, and the way they have uh, changed the way we think about, I mean, the short thing is to change the way we walk down the street, is what I always say. Um, and, you know, who, and, uh, but if you've changed the way you think about something, or you change the way you, you educate yourself about something, or you inform yourself, that to me is, uh, and, and Martha and Popel are, are, you know, are absolutely uh, in that, you know, central to that, to that, uh, the, you know, the thing, the, my passion, and I'm just hoping that somebody else will be as interested as I am. Um, because, you know, for instance, in these collages here, you could see her tiny little drawings and notes and little the changes and, you know, the whole, what she, her whole thought process. I mean, there's a thesis, there's a PhD thesis of somebody right there, and it's sitting right there in the gallery. So that's what I'd like to do. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you just answered the question. Mm. I love the idea of walking down the street. But... That's what art does. It changes our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, Popel totally changed my life the way I think. Miss him terribly. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, the, we, we have Jessica Stockholder. We have two images coming up. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I have to say, I was in Chicago when she did the street mm -hmm. corner. And I thought that street corner... Mm -hmm made me passionate mm. about her work oh yeah she's she's yeah now she absolutely you know worships the ground that tony were, walked on um tony was a huge influence i mean for this generation of artists like charles ray her uh, really just all of them tony tony was you made it possible for them to be who they are um so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, Jessica's an extraordinary artist. Um, extraordinary, just thinks outside the box all the time, as you can see. Yet I don't feel, when I look at her work, I don't feel like she, you know, she read art and objecthood or, or Michael Free. She, she took Tony in a different direction. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these these are uh, what she calls assists. So these are chairs which are not part of the work, but you attach the work to the you know to the chair to the object. Um, yeah, great colorist. Fabulous thinker, yeah. And have you shown have have you shown uh her all along? Yes, that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. You have a fascinating mm -hmm. gallery. Um, now we um now we have some fabulous paintings by Eddie Martinez. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the current show. Um, Eddie is self-taught, um, and has uh, one of the again the first things that sort of caught my attention when I saw his work was his um, fearless appropriation of uh, artists that interest him, um, which included people like Gorky, like Cobra. Um, Carol Appel, any that whole movement, and he um, um, 
that's that's when I, you know, first sort of knew and saw the work. And he is also, again, um, a real renegade when it comes to medium. Um, so he doesn't, you know, it could be, could be silk screen, it could be boat paint, it could be uh, spray paint, um, uh, it could be something collage from the studio floor. Um, they've had a pretty rough life before they come into this fancy gallery. They've been all over the place. Uh, and there's a real, he has an extraordinary uh, energy. These particular paintings are what he calls his whiteout paintings. He, he introduced them because he said, I had to discipline myself in always painting color. So I made myself paint um, either in black or white. And that was from about five years ago and it's kind of continued to evolve. Um, and um, the really rewarding thing about Eddie right now is, is, is that he's got you know, a lot of the recognition that he has. So if you look at this painting here, you know, this, these are all painted with his fingers. There's all sorts of different things that he uses, all sorts of different kinds of paint, sometimes uh, multiple different, like there'll be four, you know, he'll paint an, an area in yellow as a particular painting I'm thinking of. And there'll be four or five different colors of yellow, four or five different kinds of paint all within a small area and he seems to sort of make bring them together and coalesce and you just can't stop looking at it. Uh, so yeah he's he's again an obsessive draw um, uh, I said to Eddie I said you know it's best if you don't don't filter just just paint don't filter yourself at all he said no I know that's what I that's what I'm best doing anyway he's got um he's he's um uh, got a survey show opening in asia uh next month um and then in let me see that's um that's march and april he's got he's got this show in venice which is to do with outsider him as an outsider um and then in June, he's got the big show of the par in the Parish Museum, which will be the 12 foot tall butterflies. They're so physical. He's a very They're physical. tremendously physical, tremendously, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. And I, when I see, see six or eight of the 12 foot tall butterflies, I just don't know how the physical energy to just does it. Oh, extraordinarily physical. I think it's amazing how he just is is surrounded by paintings in in his studio, but his studio has several rooms and had, there's just so much. I know. It's all it's all he does all the time, and if he isn't doing that, he's drawing um, all the time. So. Uh, a lot of these st start with drawings, which he tends to get silk screen, get some silk screened on and enlarged. He's amazing at you know coming, starting with something that's this big and then making it into a nine by twelve foot painting. So he he has a vision about scale. So you can have a you know something on a small piece of paper and you make it in, in, in but it's a very big idea, and he can do that. So. Wow. Uh, Lucy, do you mind taking questions? No, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Thank you, Lucy. Um, this has been such an inspiring conversation. Um, we've got a couple questions here. And if anyone else would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, our first question today will be from GE. Um, GE, if you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, Lucy. Very short, simple kind of question. Um, do you collect yourself? Um, and if so, what do you collect? Um, yes, we do. Um, and um 
some of I collect works by the artists that we work with, um, and that I um, um, I think it's important to to live with, very important to live with uh, the work because if you pass it every single day on your way to the kitchen, you know you get a, a sense it either it either evolves gets and becomes more meaningful or changes and so that and then we collect uh, lots of other things too objects and just um, um, things which we're passionate passionate about wonderful thanks G. should we mention david's working uh, uh david's connection with cezanne Sure, David. David um, is my husband, and he um, he um, uh, is an expert in the field of um, 19th and 20th century uh, European uh, painting, and um, did the catalogue resume um, of Cezanne with a with a team of people, um, and then they finished. The drawings, um, it's, it's online, um, um, so yes, he's a great, a great scholar. Amazing! Thank you so much, Lucy. Thanks, GE, for the question. Um, I would love to ask a question to you, Lucy. Um, mm -hmm. I think this might be the last question in our Q and A, unless anyone else mm -hmm. would like to jump in with a question. Um. After all of your many years of experience in school at Sotheby's and, of course, as a mm -hmm. gallerist, I'm wondering if that, if at this point you have a particular medium that you feel especially drawn to or that you find yourself returning to. And then tangentially, is there a medium that you want to explore more of in the future? Um, yes, is the answer. I'm in a... Uh, explore more in the future would be uh, film and video. Um, we represent an artist called Pat O'Neill who um, pioneered um, a, a lot of um, uh, film, early film. Um, he, he, he worked uh, in special effects in, in Hollywood, but he has his own practice, which is amazing, extraordinary work, incredible work. Um, and I would love to learn more about that because it's not something I know enough about. Um, and video, um, um, and I learned that from the artists we work with, such as uh, Jacoby Satterwhite. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a constantly evolving, um, I mean, when we had to do the, 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 uh, the Jacoby installation at the, in the Great Hall of the Met, I mean, connecting him with, People who could work in that technology is um, he was able to uh, develop an entire different language because it was a new kind of new kind of technology, a different kind of technology she hadn't had access to before. So that um, what was the other thing which you were asking me? If there's a particular medium that you're most drawn to, I love drawings. I absolutely love drawings um, because I think they kind of unlock the secrets um, for any artists here. They'd probably disagree with me, but I do. Um, I think you, you, you can you get the real the little clues of their thinking, um, which lead to the big, the big ideas. Um, and um, other medium, I'm not particularly wed to any particular medium. I'm pretty, but, um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Over the years, it's definitely been works on paper. Um, Your background in sculpture is astonishing. Yes, it's you know actually when you asked the question about um, when I was you know when I'm deeply involved with with sculpture like working with. Tony and or working with Henry Moore or working with 
uh, any of the other sculptors, Tony Smith, any of the other sculptors that I've worked with over, over, over the years, when you're really in it, in the studio, really working on an exhibition, totally involved in it. And you sort of come out and you maybe, you go to a museum and you see painting and it is a very odd feeling. It's a feeling like you don't, uh, it, it, it's a feeling like, you know, you suddenly, you know, what is this? It's all two dimensional. You've been looking and thinking in three dimensions, and suddenly that makes two dimensions. What is that? And it, it becomes like, um, yeah, like learning to walk again or learning to see again. So, uh, so I find that's a very, um, I ha I've had that more than once. Um, I'm deeply involved in working in sculpture. It used to happen all the time when I was working at Tony's in Tony's studio. Just couldn't couldn't look into couldn't see in two dimensions anymore. Very odd. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, this has been such a great conversation. I'm grateful to you all for tuning in, and of course, a huge thanks again to Phyllis and Lucy for sharing so much today, and for to Phyllis for guiding the conversation. Um, and, and now. I think that was our last question. So I would also just like to extend our gratitude to Elizabeth from Mitchell Innes and Nash for supporting us so much ahead of preparing for today's event. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC and for supporting our archive, which you can explore on the Rails YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations. Please consider supporting our work through the link in the chat. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for what's going to be an amazing conversation with Justine Curland and Lynn Tillman on the occasion of Curland's exhibition, This Train, 2005-2011, at Higher Pictures. Thank you all again for tuning in today. Um, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave in rail tradition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.